I'm excited to be here today with Rabbi Jamie Gibson, Senior Rabbi of Temple Sinai here in Pittsburgh. Rabbi, how are you doing right now? Well, I think we're all kind of hunkered down and trying to figure out when to put our toe in the water. You know, with the green light says that people can get together under certain circumstances, but maybe they shouldn't, depending on their you know, personal health status or whether or not the place they want to go to is sufficiently sanitized. And, and everybody's got to make a lot more decisions than they're used to making when we used to just go about our business whenever we wanted to. So I think I'm okay. My wife is an operating room nurse at UPMC Shadyside. She's okay. She's not actually in the OR that much, but she has been, and she takes extra precautions. The only problem is that you know, my children and grandchildren live in D.C., and I haven't seen them in months, and I miss them terribly. Hi, this has upended so many different parts of life, and I'm glad to hear that you are physically safe and as mentally sound as possible, though. My heart breaks you don't get those grandkid squeezes. That's true. We're just trying to figure out. We were on the phone last night trying to figure out when that could happen, and it might not be till October. We'll see. We'll see what happens, because for, it to, for the hugs to be genuine, people have to feel safe. So, That's exactly right. So many of our congregation and your congregation want to squeeze their grandkids. And... That is right. You know, I'm grateful for your time today, and I'd love to dive right in. Part of why I wanted you to get to join me in this interview format is we're providing content to keep the members of Temple Emmanuel plugged in, connected, not only to the broader world, but also to one another and our community, is all of the work that you have done building relationships, right? Those helping others to feel safe and heard and included in community. Interfaith relationships and dialogue has been such a part of your rabbinet, and it's so vitally important in the world today. And I'm hoping you'll share with us some of your some of your stories, some of your background, how that became such an integral part of your rabbinet, and what you look forward to continuing as you ride off into the sunset, as it were. I did not know what that meant, but I know what I was supposed to do. I knew what I was supposed to do. When that really made any difference, and it told me from a very young age that there were substantial differences that would get people angry because people didn't believe the way they did or people thought that my beliefs were wrong. So um, that started things and throughout high school I was involved in inreach with the Chabad community in St. Paul and figuring out who they were. I'm a third generation Reformed Jew and knew very little about the Orthodox community in general, much less the Haredi community or Lubavitch community. And uh, when I went to college I explored my Jewish 
background, I lived an orthodox life, and yet I always was open to other forms of spirituality, to find out what they meant, how they were perceived and lived by people who believed in those systems. Between college and rabbinical school, I was a youth director in a conservative synagogue, so I had experience in all the movements, Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform. And lo and behold, I went off to Jerusalem for my first year of rabbinical school, and then uh, found myself as a bi-weekly student rabbi in East Central Oklahoma, where the mayor of the town was in fact Jewish, and there was a longtime synagogue, but it was always very quiet about its Jewish presence. And the mayor of the town, who was president of the congregation, this wonderful Jewish man named Mel Moran, took me on my very first visit to meet the most important clergy in town, the minister of the First Baptist Church. The town was 10,000 and they had 15 Baptist churches. And he was, and it was a lovely man to meet. And he, I said, I'd just gotten back from Israel and living in Jerusalem. And he said, I love the Holy Land. I just finished taking a group to the Holy Land. And we went from the Holy Land to Oberammergau in Germany to see the Passion Play. And it was so spiritually fulfilling. And I said, you know, there's kind of a direct... I said, did you go to see Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial? He said, no, 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 that would be so sad. My people wouldn't like that at all. And I said, you know, there's a kind of a direct line between what's portrayed in the Oberammergau Passion Play and the re events that are memorialized in Yad Vashem. And he was, became enraged and threw me out of his office. And I never spoke to him again, not in the four years. And I said, well, we have a lot of chasm to bridge. I visited towns all over East Central Oklahoma and met with other ministers and tried to explain who Jews were beyond being the chosen people who were the forerunners of Jesus. And then when I went to my first pulpit in North Central Wisconsin, I was the only rabbi for a hundred miles in any direction. Well, you got to be really careful with what you say because whatever you say is Judaism, that's Judaism. Aaron, where was your bi-weekly? I had the opportunity to be in Sandusky, Ohio for... Oh, yes. Yes, or greater Cleveland, right? <laughs> exactly. Cedar Point fame. Yes. Anyway, so um, I learned quickly that the Jewish community, to be safe, needed to make alliances. We have been under threat from a right-wing identity Christian nationalist group called the Posse Comitatus which was very big in northern Wisconsin and had threatened the, one of the previous rabbis. And I, again, had to kind of meet that head on um, with humanity and decency as opposed to anger and um, an attack. And it didn't convince the Posse Comitatus people that we were benign and good religionists but it convinced the people of Wausau, Wisconsin, that we were not the enemy and they were. And that is one of the most important lessons of all interfaith relations, that we, you as a rabbi, me as a rabbi, through our humanity and our decency and our willingness to engage and not become flustered and not go on the attack, have the capacity to win hearts and minds, not to become Jewish themselves, but to understand that Judaism has a an authenticity, a legitimacy that needs to be taken seriously. And so I went all over northern Wisconsin to various churches, people who had never heard of Jews or seen Jews, and that kind of really prepared me for a lot of the work I did when I came here in 1988. So I came here in 1988. I was a whopping 34 years old. My hair was black, and it was not pandemic hair, you know, but uh, that's the where we were living right now. And I realized that there were lots of different, different alliances to make. And a lot of those alliances were going to be outside the Jewish community, and they were going to be on behalf of those who were suffering from poverty or discrimination. Well, it turned out that first year that I started to get involved in some of those efforts through the East End Cooperative Ministries and through some of the other personal relationships I established with ministers, I was asked to speak at Bet Shalom Congregation, a substantial conservative congregation in Squirrelville, on this very topic. 
and I cited the appropriate texts. The appropriate texts are, you know, Amod al Damre Echa in Leviticus 19, do not stand idly by the blood of your neighbor. And in Deuteronomy 22, 3, if your neighbor loses something of value to them, you must return it to them. You may not hide. As Rashi says, you may not avert your eyes. And what if somebody steals your dignity, your opportunity, your livelihood? And I was talking about this for about 20 minutes, and an older person raised his hand and said, you know, I can't imagine why you as a rabbi would do any of these things. And I said, why not? And he said, you know, the world hates Jews. The entire world. And I was kind of young and full of myself, and I did not handle this as well as I should have. I looked at this person and said, you know, in Nigeria, there are 66 million Igbo tribesmen that woke up today without one thought of harming a Jew. And out of the 1.2 billion Chinese who were there at the time, it's obviously more now, probably at least a billion, two of them woke up without any thought about Jews. And he was unmoved. He said, you will come to understand the world hates Jews. And so what I realized when I came in 1988 from that very first encounter was that I would have to constantly justify my work with the non-Jewish community as not only being good intrinsically for its own sake, but having a benefit to the Jewish community as well. The benefit to the Jewish community is clear. When we're attacked, if we're in relationship with other groups, interracial and interfaith, they will come to our aid, they will come to our defense. If we are not in relationship, they will simply issue statements. And those statements may not be backed up with any material support whatsoever, much less physical presence. The need for this came about, again, it was even more crystallized when I met a wonderful man in the late 90s named Farooq Husseini somebody from Hyderabad, India, who was a devout Muslim, and he was the head of the outreach program at the Islamic Center of Pittsburgh. And he and I became great friends, and he and I, and an Episcopalian priest named Cynthia Bronson Swigert, would go all over the Pittsburgh region, especially the suburbs where you are, to do a presentation on Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, and show that we were not only good friends with each other, but we represented faith traditions that could in fact get along with each other. Although I must say that most people were more impressed by our personal relationship than anything we had to say about faith because they saw the tremendous friendship we shared and the respect we had for each other. I remember somebody in one of those gatherings, it was in the South Hills, raised his hand and said, how can you be friends with the rabbi? What about the Palestinians? And the room went very cold and Farouk had this incredibly disarming smile and he said, you know, they're fighting about that really hard over there in the region. Let's not import the conflict. And all over the shoulders went down in the room. Everybody, A, knew it was an important conflict. It was worthy of our time and attention, but it wasn't our conflict. So I worked for, with Farouk more and more. One of the other really highlights of my working with him was when Cynthia, Reverend Bronson Swiger, Farouk and I organized a three-week seminar on Jerusalem and the major, major faiths. Now you probably know, if you looked at the back of your BDB or something like that, that Jerusalem is mentioned in the Tanakh 606 times, at least. It's not mentioned once by name in the Quran, although it's alluded to. And I gave a very, you know, evidence-based presentation to this mixed group with a large group of Muslims in our building in Temple Sinai uh, about you know, why Jerusalem was so important to us. And I did not denigrate the Muslim connection, but why it was so important to us. And all the Muslims sat stony-faced with their arms crossed, tolerating what I was saying. And so I interrupted myself and I said, what am I saying that is so bothersome, so offensive to you? He said, well, it's not what you're saying. We just want to know why you want to blow up the mosque that's there. He said, I don't want to blow up the mosque. He said, well, I know you all do because I saw a website. And he pointed out the website of the Temple Mount Faithful. And they want to blow up the mosque to make the way for a third temple. I said, you know, that's 450 people out of 14 million people in the world. We don't want to blow up the mosque. And again, the temperature went down, shoulders went down. And we had a fabulous time. 
So only in personal relationship and dialogue can you explode some of these myths and misconceptions. God knows we have them about the Muslim community. After 9-11, which happened on a Tuesday, because I was writing a Rosh Hashanah sermon, and as soon as it happened, I pushed delete on my computer. The following three days later, from Friday, I went to Friday prayers. I went to Friday prayers because I wanted to tell our Muslim community that they were part of our community and they should feel safe. And there was an incredible outreach by the Jewish community at the time to offer services of doing grocery shopping for Muslim families, taking people to the bank, finding lawyers to defend Muslims in deportation cases because Muslims could not walk about freely in the first three or so weeks after 9-11 without fear of being attacked by people who saw all Muslims as the enemy based on what happened on 9-11. Well, Farouk and I became even closer at the time and worked throughout the years until he himself died of kidney disease. And when he died, there was a Muslim ceremony and burial, and I personally organized the public celebration of his life at Carnegie Music Hall at the Pitt campus. And it was a love fest of all the people that he had touched, with all the values that he had taught. And that relationship with the Muslim community has redounded to the benefit of the Jewish community so that after 1027, after the shooting at the Tree of Life campus, the Muslim community not only raised money, they offered to stand as shomrim, as guards, at any synagogue or Jewish home that we chose without charge, without question, without any consideration whatsoever, just to make sure that we were safe. When I did interviews in Hebrew with Israeli radio, they said, well, what are they getting? There must be some nefarious purpose. And I said, no, there isn't. You don't understand Pittsburgh, and you don't understand the power of these interfaith relationships. So I've spoken for long enough. Why don't you ask another question? Yeah, you know, one of the things that I, for me, ties together the story of the congregant at Beth Shalom who was aghast that you would do this at a time when, for him, there was a visceral threat to the Jewish community, as well as the stories of disarming a room you speak of, really speaks to the emotional nature of this work. Right. And so it feels like there are two different parts, right? There's there's the emotions, the human centered connection. And then there then there's the intellectual tradition that calls us to this, that pushes us to be our best selves intellectually as well as emotionally. And I'm, I'm curious how those two how those two play together in your thinking. Well, I think it, it, it behooves rabbis and other Jewish leaders who would be involved in interfaith dialogue and interfaith collaboration to make sure we have sufficient basic knowledge of the other religion. So in rabbinical school, I took courses on the Christian scriptures. I wanted to make sure I understood what the gospel said, what the epistles said, what their claims were, and what their critique was of their Judaism at the time. And when I started working with Farouk, he gave me a Quran, and I studied it with him and some other uh, Islamic leaders as well. So I knew what I was talking about. I know that Quranic verses can be taken out of context. For instance, there is one Quranic verse that refers to Jews as, as pigs and dogs. And that's always thrown in the face of Jews like me who would want to work with the Muslim community. But we have our own verses in the Torah that are equally troubling about how they would how we, they would ask us to look at people who are not of our group, not of our tribe, not of our clan. And we can say to non-Jews, those exist in our book, we are not going to expunge them, but they're a minority tradition and that is not the dominant mode of thought that we have. And the same thing with my Muslim friends. They will say, yes, that exists, and there are some people who believe it, and probably too many people believe that in the world of you know, 1.8 billion Muslims in the world. And yet it is not the dominant thought. And we have to create light wherever we can to push back against those forces that would accent verses like that, either in the Quran or the Torah, that accent or that heighten division and enmity. So the intellectual part is important, but it has to go hand in glove with the emotional as well. Because if I don't care about a person, they'll know immediately. I can't fake caring. 
One of the same things has happened, because some of you may not know that I have been involved extensively in intra-faith relations, which is every bit as tricky, if not more, than interfaith relations. And so at least three different iterations of intra-faith dialogue uh, have occurred with me as chair or co-chair of them. And for Jews to speak to each other more than to say, you know, I'm Yisrael Chai, the Jewish people lives, I'm Echad, we're one people. Well, we are not just one people. We have so many different strands, so many different colorful backgrounds, traditions, ethnicities, ways of looking at the world. We do ourselves harm as a people when one of us speaks for us all, when in fact we don't know that whole for whom we're speaking. And so I worked extensively with a one rabbi who now is the Orthodox rabbi of Calgary, Calgary in Canada, in Alberta, and he was the rabbi of Poli Zedek, and he was a Haredi rabbi. That's his description, not me, even though it was a modern Orthodox congregation. And he and I studied Talmud every week. And because we were on this Jewish unity project, the Federation sent me, Rabbi Miller, and Rabbi Neil Scheinland, who used to hold the pulpit where Rabbi Greenbaum is now, as conservative, orthodox, and reformed, to go to Israel, to go to Carmiel, which is our partnership area, as you well know. The week before we were going to go, Rabbi Miller sighed heavily as he closed his folio with the Talmud. He said, Jamie, I have some very disturbing things to tell you. I said, what? He said, well, if there's an opportunity that we would all pray together for one of the standard services, Shacharit, Mincha, or Mariv, I can't count you in a minion. I said, well, I don't think you're questioning my mother. I said, you must actually think I'm smart enough to be a heretic. Because if you don't believe, but you don't know much about Jewish thought, you're not a heretic, you just don't know a lot. But to be a true apikoros, as it's called, and you know the term, you actually have to know things. And I did my thesis in Maimonides and the Guide of the Perplexed. I said, Rabbi Miller, thank you so much. You think I know enough to be a real heretic, as long as you know that I don't grant you one whit of authority to validate or invalidate me. He said, of course you don't. And we went back to studying Talmud. The very next week, he said, you know, my wife and I really want to have you and Barbara over for dessert. And I said, what a wonderful idea. Just know, Rabbi Miller, we could not possibly accept your invitation without knowing in advance you would accept my invitation to eat in my house off my dishes and I keep a kosher home. He accepted to the shock of his community because he did not eat in his own congregants homes. And I did not serve him on paper plates. I served him on real plates but I had made sure everything was absolutely spotless and kosher for him. And just simple acts like that of sitting and eating together and sharing hospitality said more to the Jewish community than just about anything else we could have said. One more story about that, then I'll be done. So he and I were asked to, in the name of the uh, Jewish Unity Project, to present a formal debate. A formal debate is when there's a position and a position and a rebuttal and rebuttal. And the debate was on whether or not there should be separation of religion from state in the state of Israel. He argued for it. I argued against it, that there shouldn't be separation of religion and state. And after the position, the position, the rebuttal, and the rebuttal, there was silence. 450 people did not know what they had just seen until we told them that I wrote every word that Rabbi Miller said. And he wrote every word that I said. And he had to know me well enough to know the arguments I would make. And I knew him well enough to know the arguments and sources he would make. That's what interfaith or intrafaith dialogue is. Getting to know the other person so well, you know where they're coming from. You know what's important to them. And you value it even if you disagree strongly in principle. So I have many partners in the African American community, in the Christian community, the Muslim community, who are my dearest, dearest friends. They've been to my house for Shabbat and Seder. We disagree on many things, sometimes on important issues involving the state of Israel. But they're my dear friends, and the friendship allows us to work together on other projects in which we share values and share a position. That's the value to the Jewish community, and that's the value to the community that we serve by involving ourselves in these efforts and relationships. 
I couldn't agree more. And those those relationships uplift the whole community, the Jewish community here in Pittsburgh. I'm curious to hear you say a little bit more about relationships within the African American community. It is an absolutely heartbreaking time in our country right now. And the last time you and I got to cross paths were when we were standing outside and you had the honor of being one of the people to address the clergy gathering as we came together in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. Would you say a little bit more about those relationships and perhaps also your hopes moving forward? Well, the people who spoke at that rally and one of the organizers was a reverend named Glenn Grayson. Again, these are my personal friends. When things have happened in the African-American community long before you came in the, in the early 90s, there was the killing of a man named Johnny Gamage, where a suburban policeman literally ch- sat on his chest until he died. There was such anger in the African-American community. And I went to the Hill, to the community gathering. I was the only white face besides the mayor. And people said to me, how can you go there? Aren't you afraid for your life? I said, no, my fellow brothers and sisters are hurting, and I needed to be there with them. I have preached in African-American churches. They have been guests at our pulpit. Together, we formed PIN, the Pennsylvania Interfaith Impact Network, to promote progressive causes in the name of our faith, not just in the name of advocacy. And by creating these relationships, we have been able to be there with and for each other, not only at times of community tragedy, but Reverend Grayson's own son was killed by a stray bullet when he was at college about eight, nine years ago. Of course I was there at the funeral. Of course I hugged him for dear life. He has been in our synagogue when I've asked him to be when we had to stand together against the hate in Charlottesville or what happened in Charleston in Mother Emanuel Church. The more we share experiences, the more we find out about each other that there's far more that connects us in our vision and values than divides us in a particular position we may hold. And these people are some of my dearest friends in the world. One of them, you know, I I asked one, I, I would like not to say this minister's name, but I was very upset when I saw some of the what I considered anti-Semitic uh, features of the Black Lives Matter Black Lives Matter website several years ago, and I said, "Is this what you believe?" And this person said to me in the quietest voice, a mild but powerful rebuke, "Why do you think that I stand for them and they for me? Because of the color of my skin?" Do I need to divorce myself from some of the concerns they have to satisfy you? And we were able to take my assumptions and my prejudice about the situation and break it down. So I understood what this minister truly stood for and that because of that, we were able to continue to work together. And there was not anti-Semitism in this person's advocacy of the concept of Black Lives Matter without necessarily supporting the organization called Black Lives Matter. It's an important reminder for everyone today, right? It seems to be a question that pops up again and again in Jewish circles and a reminder that not only are the stakes greater, but that we run, we run a risk when we generalize always. Well, my father, maybe I'll end just quoting my father, Allah Shalom. My father used to say this wonderful twisted logic. He used to say, all generalizations are faulty, including this one, (laughs) which I'll let you smile about. I like it. I like it. One more question, if I might. And it's kind of a two-parter. The first is, what comes next? As you think about the work in the city of Pittsburgh, what are those facets that need to be explored or deepened or maintained? Where do you see energy and momentum right now? And the second part, after, after the well-deserved rest and with perhaps a freer hand, not speaking on behalf of Temple Sinai, but speaking on behalf of Rabbi Jamie Gibson, what's next for you in this work? Uh, let me take the second one first. I think that we have a really critical moment in our nation's history. You may not know this, I was an American history teacher in high, uh, for high school before I became a rabbi. I often joke I was a history teacher who couldn't get a job, and so I ended up being a different kind of teacher. 
I think that the values war that's going on in our country right now between those who are what I would call liberal and tolerant and those who are illiberal and intolerant is coming to a head this November and I will have not just things to say but much work to do and I don't care if I speak in front of any group ever again about it as long as I can work to affect the coalitions that will help that liberal tolerant view prevail over the illiberal intolerant views in our country politically. Um, I don't think I can give an accurate projection as to the future. I used to say that I, in rabbinical school, I got an A in prophets, but I failed prophecy. I really, you know, it's really, really hard. As somebody said, predicting the future is really hard to do except for the future, easy to do except for the future part, right? I do think this is a moment where substantive systemic change is possible because the African-American and white communities are galvanized together on this and want to promote the best possible outcome of justice, even if they're not willing to, to dismantle systemic white privilege, which is a whole other issue for a whole other time. I look forward to being with my grandchildren when I'm allowed to be with them physically, which I'm not right now. I look forward to doing some teaching on the side. I already have a couple opportunities to do that. And, um, and to spend significant time with my partner. She and I have been together since she was 17 in high school and I was 19 in college. And we wrote letters three times a week for five years. And um, she is still the love of my life. And we're looking forward to spending a lot more time together and with our family and doing some of our work in the world where, while we are still both healthy enough and eager enough and passionate enough to do that work. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so grateful for your time, particularly in these last weeks as you transition from being the senior rabbi of Temple Sinai to the rabbi emeritus. I'm grateful for your sharing this pulpit, teaching my community about the vital importance of this work. And I look forward to continuing to follow where you lead on this front. Thank you so much for your time today. We'll see each other at rabbinic association meetings because retirement doesn't affect those. Anyway, Beautiful. pleasure to be with your people. I think you have a terrific congregation. I know so many of the people there, and I consider them dear, dear friends.